Hey everyone, this is Alan Schimmel and welcome to another Security Boulevard webinar. I uh, hope everyone is getting ready for the RSA conference, security's biggest event coming up in just a few weeks in San Francisco. In today's webinar, we're going to look at, you know, a little sneak peek at what we think and our panel of experts think will be some of the hottest uh, stories, trends, topics at RSA 2018. Before we begin, though, let me quickly just uh, go over our go to webinar control panel with you. Um, we have set aside time for questions at the end of today's webinar. And so if you look at your go to webinar control panel, you'll see a, a section marked questions. And if you click the little carrot or arrow, so it's pointing down, it'll, it will expand. And you can see that you can type your questions in there in real time. And we ask that you do that. Don't wait for the end of the webinar to start typing in your questions. We may not get to them or see them in time. Type your questions as they come into your head. This way they're saved here. We'll get to them at the appropriate time. We will have a record of them. And if you're like me, you don't have to worry about forgetting them. So please type your questions in under the question section. Um, we also have a chat section. And that is more if you're having technical difficulties. Perhaps your uh, slides aren't advancing, the audio gets choppy, whatever. Do not type that in the question section. If you could put it into the chat section, we do have um, uh, folks standing by their engineers to try to help solve any kind of technical issues you might have. Want to bring one other thing to your attention today, and that is that we will be doing polling questions as well. We only have actually one polling question, but polls are a great way to kind of judge the audience in terms of where are you at so that we can better uh, frame the conversation to meet your needs and your circumstances. So please, the polling question is a multiple choice question. Just answer it as quickly as possible. And it makes for a more interactive experience, not just for everyone attending, but even for the panel and panelists and moderators like myself as well. So answer our polling question if you can. I think it'll come right after slide two. But with that out of the way, let's turn back to our panel today and talk about RSA 2018, what's hot in the cybersecurity space. I should mention that today's webinar is sponsored by White Source Security and CA Vericode, two of our founding sponsors here at Security Boulevard, and we're very happy to have them participate with us today. Let me introduce you to our panel. And if we can move to slide two, please. So our panel today is made up of myself, Editor-in-Chief, DevOps.com, Security Boulevard, Container Journal. And then I'm also happy to be joined by Rami Elron, who's Senior Director of Product Management at White Source. Uh, Rami joins us today, I think, from Israel. Rami, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Just a little sound check. And then joining us, I think he's been a repeat. He's been here before. Tim Jarrett, Director of Product Management at Vericode. Tim, nice to have you back. Nice to be back, Alan. Good to talk with you. All right. So before we get started with our discussion over what's hot at uh, RSA 2018, let's quickly pop a poll question in here and find out Who's going to 20? Who's going to RSA this year? Really simple. Yes, no, or maybe you're not sure yet. But this this shouldn't stump anyone. We're only three weeks out. I would hope you, you have made your selection. So we'll close voting off here in five, four, three, two, one. And survey says, well, pretty much as I expected, 78% of you will unfortunately not be attending RSA. 9% uh, are, 13% aren't quite sure yet. Well, let me first say, for those of you who are not sure, if you go to devopsconnect.com and uh, click on the DevSecOps days at San Francisco RSA, we do have a code there for a free expo pass. 
So if what is holding you back is, is maybe a free pass to the show, you live out in the Bay Area, please grab a free pass on us. And if you'd like to come, please come to it. But Tim and Rami, Rami, I know in talking off mic, you are not going to be able to make RSA this year. Tim, are you going to be out there? I will be. Yeah, I'm. Uh, uh, it'll be my sixth RSA, I think. Uh, so, uh, uh, looking forward to being back. Yeah, Tim, Rami, what do you think are the biggest kind of inhibitors to people going or not going to RSA? So I'll start. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think that um, one thing that's been interesting over the past few years, even just in the time that I've been attending, I think my first one was in 2012, is that um, RSA has always been a, a very business focused uh, conference. And so you, you get, you know, a lot of you know business leaders attending and, and so forth. But um, I think that there's a, a, uh, there's been a drop off in, in kind of more technical uh, talks, you know, it, what it, it seems like other shows have gotten more business focused and, uh, and, you know, the, but the technical audience is, uh, is not as strong maybe, or the technical interest of RSA is not as strong maybe as it, as it has been in the past. Um, I think there are some things that happen around the edges of RSA, like the DevSecOps, uh, you know, day that, uh, that happens on Monday that, that have helped to counterbalance that a little bit, but um you know, I, I think you know if I talk to a lot of the the practitioners, maybe their boss is going, but uh, but they aren't. Rami, any thoughts on that? Well, I I, I must say that with all the uh, the burgeoning exposure to uh, threats and all the news, everything that uh, is taking place uh, over the past year or so, I think this is a great venue for sharing ideas and for promoting uh, technology options. It's uh, well. It's unfortunate that I am unable this year to attend, but uh, in the past it has definitely been a great environment to uh, meet with people who uh, present different angles. Uh, and by the way, this is uh, actually going to be one of the topics that I'm going to touch upon: the multitude of angles and presentation perspectives that uh, has been so uh, uh, so profound in the past, and I think is a great uh, opportunity this year as well. Absolutely. If we could move to the next slide, please. Also, um, let me let me suggest something though that I think really inhibits, especially Tim. You know the technical stuff. It's not for a lack of technical sessions. I think there are a lot of technical sessions actually, and there's a lot of hands-on training going on this year and so forth. Um, for me, I you know, and this was something back when I found a still secure and we used to exhibit there every year you know so many companies exhibit there right and and it's not cheap to exhibit there but you know from an individual's point of view to attend rsa it's an awful lot of money right i i believe a full a full boat you know conference pass is two to three thousand dollars if you have to fly into san francisco it's not cheap to fly as Someone, you know, put in the questions, Mark, can we get a free airline ticket? And even more money than the airline ticket, hotels in San Francisco for RSA are like $500 a night and up. So it is it is a big expense, you know, when you start yeah. talking about taking multiple people on a team out there. It's, RSA is not, not cheap, that's for sure. Yeah, we, we actually, Alan, had one person on our team calculate, who was a late registrant, that it was going to be cheaper for him to attend RSA for three days but stay in Las Vegas and fly back and forth every night than it was going to be to get a hotel room in San Francisco. Of course, yeah. that may speak to you know lack of planning, but those were actually the numbers that, that came out when they were looking at attending. I, I wouldn't doubt it. it. It's crazy. It's crazy. But that being said, let, you know, RSA 2018, they are expecting over 50,000 attendees this this year, 
which is up from, I think, 42 or 43,000 last year, 35 the year before that. I mean, RSA has, you know, if you look at attendance over, let's say, the last 15 years, it's literally the proverbial hockey stick, right? It, it just keeps rising. So someone's shelling out all that money and filling up all those hotel rooms. But why? I mean, why, why as an industry do we come out here? Well, it's a full week dedicated to security, whether you want to call it cyber or infosec or, or what have you. It's, it's, it's where the world comes to meet security. And I think, um, Tim, you might have already pulled it, you know, uh, pointed it out, but we here at Security Boulevard and DevOps.com for the fourth year in a row will be partnering with RSA and presenting a DevOps Connect DevSecOps Days on Monday of RSA week. And that will be at the Moscone uh, Center on level three. And again, if you go to DevOpsConnect.com, we do have links there with uh, discount codes for you to get a free pass to DevSecOps Days as well as a free expo pass. So if you're coming to RSA or you're planning or thinking about it, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers. Uh, you can check it out on, DevSe on DevOps Connect. I uh, highly, highly recommend for you to uh, come. We're going to be using a lot of different terms for the RSA uh, conference kind of sessions this year. And I, just to be clear there's keynotes which are up on the main stage about half of those keynotes come from uh major sponsors of rsa who get a keynote as part of their sponsorship and then there's the, and traditionally there's always socially active or socially prominent folks who will be speaking there's usually people from government either homeland security the military nsa something like that, who speak. Then there are individual tracks. Well, there are tracks that are dedicated to a subject, such as DevSecOps. There's individual sessions, which is just one session. And then there's also a lot of hands-on training uh, by companies as diverse as, you know, ISC Squared and, and SANS to, to others. So there really is a pretty wide range of, of uh, of, you know, uh, attendance kind of options, whether you're technical business, what you came for or what have you, not to mention two full exhibit floors full of security companies hawking their wares, giving out trade show tchotchkes and, and so forth. So for anyone who hasn't been to RSA, it is those, those exhibit floors can be overwhelming. Let's move on, though, and really jump into kind of the meat of, of what we expect to see at RSA this year. If we could move to the next slide. Okay. So I think without a doubt, the biggest sort of buzz around RSA in terms of security technology this year is going to be around machine learning and artificial intelligence, ML and AI. And um, it's that's not new, by the way. I, I think last year, machine learning and AI was probably the hot thing as well. And, and that tends to be the, the MO at RSA, right? Cloud security was the hot thing for many years. Before that, it was NAC. And before that, it was other things. Um, gentlemen, I'm going to let you take the floor here. Rami, you're, you're our first time guest on... Uh, Security Boulevard webinars. Why don't you have first crack at this? Sure, thanks. So there are many questions actually to be asked here. If uh, if the question is uh, whether uh, the discussion over AI and ML is uh, hyped or overhyped, I think that the short answer is that there is hype. But uh, for the most part, both AI and ML are still dependent on humans to tell the good from the bad. And that said, there is a potential to enhance ability to deal with uh, threats much better than we do today. Now, uh, it, as I said, there were several questions that uh, that could be uh, could be posed here, and I would like to touch, if that's okay, with uh, touch uh, on a on a couple of them. 
uh, first of all, uh, is it is it that uh, you know? Uh, let let me say it otherwise. The longer answer here would warrant a closer inspection of several facets, and a special attention would be to the claim that security poses a unique challenge to AI and ML. I think that the significance is pronounced because uh, AI can arguably be more easily uh, to uh, carry out effective attacks than for effective defenses. And the terms, as you noted, uh, they, were not, uh, they are not uh, new. Uh, they have moved into the limelight years ago. And uh, that, that said, there has been an unprecedented surge in the attention during the past couple of years. I think most of it has to do with the fact that they represent a wide spectrum, both AI and ML. They have become a crucial uh, contributor to, uh, well, essentially to the modern lifestyle. They span gaming, they span uh, commerce, science, healthcare, and they are definitely, potentially at least, meritorious for security. They can be used to enhance security through various paths. Uh, in the past, it was discussed that uh, better threat detection could be uh, provided, better accuracy, quicker identification of uh, patterns in an immense uh, set of data. Uh, but I think that uh, one, of the, one of the indicators that we are seeing things that are somewhat different is the uh, definite increase in the number of startup companies that are focusing on security solutions that are featuring such uh, technology. So it is really hardly surprising that we see a lot of organizations that are exploring ways to uh, leverage this. And there is a promise here. And the promise is basically, and I'm going to touch upon something that is rather, well, not immediate, but in the past it has been, uh, asked, it has been brought up whether or not there is a skill a challenge, a skill problem that we need to address. And I think that uh, an ability to let humans accomplish more and thereby potentially addressing, at least in the mid to long term, the skill shortage issue, I think this is a great thing that AI is potentially able to uh, provide. Of course, improving security protection thanks to vulnerability identification, accurate uh, detection of security attacks and so forth. But this is definitely a, a direction that, uh, that needs to be uh, further studied. Uh, there are additional topics. I don't want to, uh, to take too much time uh, of this, but if I may just say a couple of words on the, uh, on the challenge that uh, is posed here. I think that the adoption of the AI and of ML, uh, this adoption is, is, is mired by absence of acceptable perhaps industry-wide metrics, uh, that those metrics would lead to a, a I would say, a, they would lead to a, a lower sense of skepticism regarding the ability of both uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to solve complex problems, especially in a manner that would outclass uh, traditional approaches. They are currently lacking means, they are lacking standards and lacking frameworks to objectively uh, do all the evaluation and uh, establish, even compare the accuracy between different solutions. And, uh, you know, I I've came across uh, quite a few who claim that despite having projects that have been instigated, uh, AI may not really be employed in practice in many areas that concern uh, cyber uh, security. And I think that part of that has to do with a, an issue of a, a likeness or lack thereof. But I, I will actually stop here. This is a discussion, not a speech. So uh, <laughs> I'll, get, uh, I'll get to that later, if that's okay. Tim, I'm going to give you a chance to weigh in before I put in my three cents. Sure. So I think that the thing that you have to ask with any of these technologies, and I think this is, you know, it, if, if six years of attendance qualifies me to have a, a law of the RSA conference, um, I'll, I'll posit one, which is, uh, you know, the, the law is is that uh, you should always have a clear understanding of what the user problem is that you're trying to solve with these technologies before you bring, you know, yet another startup to the table with the technology, right? And I, I think that the, the the promise of machine learning and AI is is helping you know, organizations make sense of the data overload that they've got. I mean, the, the good news is that security and whether you're talking about operational security, which, you know, a good chunk of RSA is, is really focused on. Um, and even if you're talking about, you know, application security, kind of pre-production uh, looking at, at eliminating vulnerabilities, um, you, 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 we're, we're in a data-rich environment. And so the intuition is that if you apply 
advanced technologies for uh, for you know kind of making sense of that data that you can get to actionable insights more quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's there, there is some value in in that insight. I think the challenge has been number one, it, we we have a skills gap, but I would argue that we don't have um, enough people, you know, kind of doing much more than than applying very basic uh, machine learning, very basic kind of clustering algorithms and that sort of things to 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 get two points of insight on data. And the second problem, as Rami stated up front, is that it's a there is a human dimension to this. There's a there's a training challenge with the data. Uh, there's a, a problem of uh, you know making sure that you're uh, not over selecting for a, a particular outcome when you're when you're training the the uh, the algorithms that you're using and so you've got um, you know kind of a, a technology but um, in a lot of cases what you end up with is a technology that that then shifts the burden uh, from you know manual review of the data to effectively you know training the uh, the algorithms to, to be effective um, and so, you know, what, what I'd really love to see is, and you know, what I suspect everybody in the industry would love to see is machine learning and artificial intelligence that really fulfills this uh, vision of, of pulling signal from noise and doing it in a way that you don't need scarce skills to, to make that happen, because it's only then that you can not only solve the staffing problem that the biggest companies in the, in the, uh, in the world have with dealing with this data overload, but it also democratizes it, right? It makes it available for the broader segment of companies that are also subject to cyber threats and who may be the suppliers to big companies. But until the point that we've got uh, machine learning tools that are, you know, again, to Rami's point, effective at, you know, meeting, you know, uh, you know goals of, of performance and everything else without requiring specialized training, without requiring, uh, you know, the specialized knowledge, then, then we, we haven't reached that point yet. Um, so I, I think that it's going to be interesting to see you know, kind of where the industry is this year, and and to you know be able to <laughs> my, to to judge our own signal to noise level in terms of who's got something that's really promising in machine learning versus you know where is it just being applied as the latest marketing buzzword. Sure. So let me let me uh, weigh in here, guys. And so first of all, when has the security industry ever shied away? from approaching some new buzzword that will help raise VC money and create a shiny new trinket for all the security folks to oogle and are about, regardless of, regardless of whether or not it in fact worked. But when we look at machine learning and AI, for me, there's, there's two aspects, and both Rami and Tim, you hit them, peripherally anyway. Number one is that we look at ML and AI for help in automation, right? For many of us, we're drowning in a sea of our own data. And the, I, the promise of machine learning in AI is that it's a life raft or you know, a life preserver that will keep us from drowning, right? That somehow it will go through and sift out, Tim, as you said, the signal to noise and, and give us actionable intelligence, which is sort of a holy grail in security we've been looking for. Number two is we do have a skills gap, not only a skills gap, a people gap. We just can't find enough skilled people to get fill all the cybersecurity jobs that are out there. And somehow or another, we've got this notion that ML and AI, um, you know, will somehow take the place of people and, and allow us to, to, you know, gloss over the gap. Now, here's a funny thing. I go back in security a long way. I remember when IPSs first came out to replace IDSs. And everyone thought it was a no-brainer. 85% of the attacks you see are rather guarded variety. Do you really need someone to say, yeah, block that, or no, don't block that? A machine can do that really easily. You don't even have to be Watson or some high-level AI to make those calls. But yet... You know, as recently as, let's say, 2009, 2010 was the last time I looked at this. IPS, though widely adopted, was in fact still being used as IDS. Many people turned on minimal, minimal amounts of automated blocking because they just didn't trust uh, the, the blocking 
technology to not block something that was important. And I think we, we unfortunately suffer from the same thing with a lot of our ML and AI. Even if we have the capability, there are a lot of people who just think that ML and AI's job is really just to sift through, reduce the noise to signal, and present it to a human to make a decision on. And I, I posit that we need to get to a point where humans don't have to make the decisions on a lot of these things, because the speed of business today is so fast and there's so much pressure to move along that if you're going to have a human have to make these decisions, they're the bottleneck. And, you know, if you have that bottleneck, people are going to go around it. And, and unfortunately, that happens too often. I'll give you each just a couple of seconds to wrap up, and then we'll move on, though. Tim, I'm going to let you go first. Rami, you're going to have the last word on this slide, okay? Tim, go yeah. ahead. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, I, I, your cynicism is showing a little bit, but I, <laughs> I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> um, but the other point that I would make is, again, it goes back to what is, what's the problem that we're trying to solve for the user. And the, the challenge that we've had is that these technologies that we seek to deploy in a production environment, we then don't feel are safe enough to turn on. Uh, and it's not just IPS, IDS. It's also, you know, web application firewalls. It's, you know, runtime application security protection. Yep. You know, all these technologies that are supposed to take the, the human and the thought out of the process aren't trusted. Um, and so, you know, that that's the big barrier that I think that any new technology in the space that wants to do uh, actions automatically has to overcome. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, th we've got two choices. We can either figure out how we can have ML and AI, you know, kind of overcome that trust barrier, or we may have to acknowledge that we need to solve the problem that they're trying to solve in some other way. Yep. Fair enough. Rami, last word goes to you on this one. Don't feel obligated, though. Okay. Well, it, it won't be a single word. I, that right. I can say. <laughs> uh, I, I, AI is definitely no silver bullet, uh, but the measure of its success can really come from uh, an ability to enhance uh, the organization's ability to reduce some of the human attention to uh, security matters, at least uh, at least uh, in part. And uh, I think it gets even more interesting when you think that they can really complement uh, each other. The uh, areas where uh, humans are focusing on and those that are slated or at least are uh, believed to be the turf uh, for AI. Uh, addressing, uh, addressing problems such as reducing the problem from uh, uh, dealing with a huge number of records, for instance, to a subset that can later inspect it by humans, that, that would be a, a good example. Yeah. One thing, and I tried to say that earlier, I'll, I'll go through it very quickly. ML, AI, bo both essentially, if we're not digging into the uh, differences be between them, and there are, but it, they are highly susceptible to uh, the likeness uh, issue that I mentioned earlier. And uh, in other words, they are dependent on some kind of similarity. This is more a treat of uh, machine learning, similarity between the model and the real world uh, environment. and. This this could basically lead to some errors, and they also drive a a, a re-review from people regarding the potential that is typically otherwise associated to AI, and it might even disappoint them. But I think that one of the areas that we may have not been able to touch, given the short time that we have at hand, is that AI can also be employed by attackers. And this could extend yeah. the attack surface and complicate the detection and I mentioned very briefly earlier that uh, it is arguably, again, I stress this, it is arguably easier, given the state of AI today, to serve in the hands of attackers in a more effective way than can be used for defense, uh, defense uh, purposes. And this would need uh, to drive us to conclude whether or not we should consider improved AI to counter such a potential, yeah. such attack potential. Uh, so... Uh, I think to, to sum it up, and this, I, I hope it doesn't sound too cynical, but despite all the advancements, uh, the, the intelligence that has been attained thus far by AI has not really been stated to correspond to a mature uh, human. It is more like a young child, uh, at least for general AI, not for the most specific or narrow, uh, narrow uh, variants. 
but it is evolving. It is increasing in adoption. But uh, and even though it may not necessarily accelerate detection, if it's of malware or other things, I think that if it is largely complementary to a human analyst and not a replacement, there is much to expect here, and there is much to look for. Excellent. Good way to end that one. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, so. You know, we, we've had the Cambridge Analytica stuff. You know, they took information that they may or may not have been entitled to from Facebook. Um, but I, I think the bigger issue is not that they got the information from Facebook. I think the bigger issue is, my goodness, how much does Facebook, and it's not just Facebook, how much does Google, how much does Amazon, how much does Apple, how much does Microsoft, how much does Big Brother know about all of us, right? And and do we care even? <clears throat> Again, we were talking off. My Tim has young children. My my children are teenagers. They seem to have zero expectation of privacy. <clears throat> they put their lives out there on on the social webs and and don't care. They don't care if they're prospective employers or college recruiters or or whatever will you know whoever will see it what you know what should we be doing is is privacy going the way of the dodo bird i don't know tim why don't you take if you want if you'd like to chime in here sure alan um i'm in a weird position for this i've been blogging personally for close to 17 years now um, so I'm in a, in a kind of digital, uh, gap generation, I think, uh, <laughs> they, you know, my, my life didn't begin with the internet, like, uh, you know, a lot of people entering the workforce now, but I've been, you know, comfortable with, with, uh, the kind of social media for a very long time. I think that the, um, the thing that is interesting to me about the Facebook, uh, case is not so much, um, you know, the, the as you said the specifics of who got what data but it, it does point out the the bigger challenge which is you know what's the the second hand use of the data what's the tertiary use of the data um and you know it's it's almost as though um we're making a, a bargain uh for a one-time use of our personal information for something for our benefit and you know building community building brand uh you know building recognition for who we are and what we do is for our benefit and and when i see my my kids want to have their own youtube channels you know <laughs> my, my kids who are seven and eleven right um yeah. you know that that's all that they're thinking about um but i i think that the 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 challenge is that this data does have a, a life after its initial use so i guess the question that we have to ask ourselves is you know to what extent is that data worth you know keeping private and i think it depends on you know kind of what you expect the use of that data to be after uh, after the initial use. So, you know, if we carry this back to the security context, certainly, you know, credit card numbers, when you have one static string of, of digits that can be used indefinitely to, you know, as, as currency, have to be something worth protecting. And that's driven a lot of uh, attention and energy, uh, you know, with, with mixed success in application security, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, but if you if you change the nature of the data, if you move to something like a one-time transaction identifier, as you have with uh, you know kind of the chip-based cards or the you know kind of the Apple Pay, Samsung Pay model, um, then it's a it's a slightly different story because the half-life and the usability of the the information is so much uh, shorter, right? You don't have that that as much of that pass-along problem. So you know, I, I think that the the challenge for privacy is is twofold. Number one, you know, where can we figure out where we can stop, uh, you know, kind of storing and 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 making you know data uh, available for people where it does have a long uh, afterlife, where it is you know does continue to be useful. But yeah, I, I think for a lot of people, you know, you just have to look at the 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 millions and millions of people who are on Facebook and Twitter and everything else. You know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, I, I don't I don't care because, you know, the benefit that I'm getting out of this is valuable and I'm not, you know, I'm not thinking about the long term consequences. Maybe yeah. that's not the right way to think about it in terms of a, of a job market. But 
I certainly do think that there's been a societal shift uh, to a degree. Um, but, you know, last but not least, I would argue that it makes a big difference if, you know, you're talking about some place where you've explicitly entered into the bargain and you know, you know, where you're giving up your data and what you're giving it away for versus, you know, somebody's reselling your data after the fact and you don't have knowledge about it. And I think that's the that's the thing that, that's interesting to me about the Cambridge Analytica case is that it starts to underscore, you know, well, why are they doing that? And, you know, it may be within the terms of service, but should it be? So that that's the interesting part of the discussion for me. Got it. Rami? So, first of all, I think we all acknowledge that uh, enormous amounts of data are placed uh, in uh, in various areas uh, and within different uh, bodies, and they span the identity, personality, preferences. We do so knowingly, we do so unknowingly. In addition to that, uh, this data, and this is something that not too many people think about, at least not uh, on a daily basis, this could be employed to study, to identify uh, uh, implicit relationships, and it leads to insights that deliver a much extended view into our characteristics, into a picture that could be uh, created from our profile. And uh, many people often do not spend much time thinking about the ramifications, even of the terms and conditions that they uh, agree to. So if we're talking about expectations for reasonable uh, privacy, I think that reasonable is the key part here. And uh, the emergence of, uh, of uh, advanced technolo uh, technology, uh, connectivity, communication, all of that had a, an immense impact on uh, everyone's lives. I think, however, that the nature of technology that surrounds us and this ever-accelerating pace of technology, this was not really met with what may be called a commensurate level of caution, a, well, cautiousness. And I would even say, I would go as far as to say that many have downplayed the point of such cautiousness a, because in some people's opinion, that would even arguably hamper part of the essential experience characteristics that underlie a new technology. You know, it's quick, it's immediate, it's always available. So if we just look around ourselves, how, how many people uh, around ourselves uh, walk in the streets and are not using their mobile phone in, in some way? It looks as if connection is not really an option, but an imperative. So if we're asking about security, privacy, uh, let's be honest, non-expert people uh, of all ages, by the way, who even dare to show a passing interest in security, set, uh, security parameters, security settings, uh, I don't know about your experience. I think that many are often dismissed and are definitely not regarded as cool. Uh, with all the data crumbs uh, that constitute uh, what, may be, what can be called the collective experiences and actions and preferences, I think when all of this is shared, stored, and analyzed and utilized to construct a, a picture of our profile, uh, there are concerns that uh, that arise. And this this really brings me to the point I would like to address uh, uh, what you mentioned regarding uh, regarding uh, how children get exposed to this and potentially what is the effect on society. I think that education is a key is a key uh, facet here, perhaps lack thereof. Uh, given the current state and adoption of technology, it starts, say, uh, in childhood for most people. It's really disturbing that people are not exposed to and they don't really get during their childhood any serious education program on security privacy, proper usage of application and security threats, um, knowledge concerning uh, how we download applications, how we install them, terms and conditions. Now, you may think that this is really too much, but these are things that we are exposed to. We, it's not just a particular part of society. Everyone dealing with this technology in some way deals with these aspects. And the meanings of, uh, and the nuances of privacy in the digital world are, uh, for the most part, overlooked. So uh, how easily privacy can be compromised. So I think it's, it's really imperative to engender something that is continuously updated, a program that will serve for multiple education tracks. It is intended for different ages. It should cover the topics, some of which I mentioned, many I have not. And uh, it should be mandated just as any other mandated uh, program. Some would argue that perhaps being security conscious, definitely at a young age, is uncommon. 
and that it, it does not exactly, uh, well, it doesn't really reward people with much credit, at least uh, socially wise. But I think that the significance is pronounced when we factor that those that might be unaware, those who are unaware of the risks or even unwilling to demonstrate ample attention to privacy protection, they are nonetheless able to adversely affect by their very actions and decisions, not just themselves, but others as well. So yeah. all of this goes really to the point that I really think that education should get a much stronger uh, and much more pronounced attention, given all that we have been discussing uh, thus far. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. I'd love to see a class like this, probably offered in middle school to high school here in the U.S. I think younger than that, they're too young to understand it, but great. And I'll, I'll just say one word, and then we got to move on because we're taking a lot of time. But I, I do think you're going to start seeing at RSA and other shows security vendors coming up with uh, products that will claim to sanitize your social profile, make you more aware of what you're sharing, erase things you don't want shared, and, and try to give you a little bit more control over that. But let us move on because time is a moving. So, you know, probably one of the biggest stories last year or over the course of the last year was the Equifax breach. And it was big for several reasons. Number one, just the sheer volume and the kind of information breached here was was extraordinary. Right. I mean, it really had to hit you between the. Um, but secondly, we, we get breaches all the time, right? This weekend, a uh, large retailer, I think 5 million credit cards were breached. So it's not just the amount of records. But the, the other thing, you, not unique, but rather run of the mill about Equifax is that the breach was accomplished using a vulnerability on an open source component, in this case, Struts, that was well known for months, if not years. And because it wasn't patched, so many uh, organizations were vulnerable, including Equifax, and 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 you know, shocking. We've got another big data breach. This isn't new to 2018 or 2017. I, this is a, a broken record that's been playing for many years, and I don't know what it takes for us as an industry to to fix it. But Tim. Rami, both Vericode and White Hat deal a lot with AppSec. You both deal with scanning code before apps are deployed. We don't have a lot of time, but what the heck? When is this going to sink in already? Rami, why don't you go first this time? Well, there are quite a few things that can be said. I think that basically uh, we are facing an ever-increasing uh, attack surface. Uh, and there are notable challenges that say that enterprises are facing uh, in order to combat the security risks. Uh, now, in order to cope as best as possible with those uh, challenges, uh, organizations are changing. And uh, I would say that perhaps notably, so, uh, so does the organization uh, culture. Unfortunately, uh, the attempt to address some of those risks, it, uh, it may struggle in order to attain an effective level of team collaboration. And that, uh, that is an important point to keep up. Now, now, known security vulnerabilities, they represent compelling targets for data attacks. And uh, the growing popularity of open source arguably led to higher security awareness by organizations and by developers, but it also highlighted a need for improved processes and best practices compared to those in the uh, a, a, that the business typically uh, would uh, employ, at least uh, traditional, uh, traditionally. And uh, it compelled enterprises to employ new tools for doing everything. Now, I think that uh, many of those breaches, uh, especially those that we are discussing, they could have been prevented if we're talking about managed open source usage. Detecting the vulnerable open source components can be done best via dedicated tools. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that addressing open source warrants a different approach than proprietary uh, code does, one that uh, typically would demand integration of intelligence, so to say, from, uh, uh, from the community. And in order to do so, I think that uh, perhaps we need to change a bit our mindset. Organizations 
uh, are increasingly realizing that uh, best practices need be considered in order to realize some of the benefits that are associated with development that employs open source uh, components. And employing a tool set such as, uh, such an, uh, as a, an S, uh, SCA tool that would facilitate the process of establishing an inventory of, a, of open source components, detecting vulnerable components, alerting on them, automating the remediation through a workflow policy-based process. All of this are good steps in the right direction. Just excuse me, can we move to the next slide, please? I forgot to advance the slide, I apologize. Uh, Tim, why don't you go? Absolutely. So. I think that, um, you know, uh, Rami's absolutely right that there's a cultural challenge and that there's an opportunity for the assistance of uh, kind of dedicated and focused tools to get after the, the open source problem. And I also like the, the point you call out about the economics of it, right? And I think that for, you know, it's, it's been pretty clear for a while that this is where the, the attacks of opportunity against the application layer are shifting. If you can, you know, download you know, the proverbial meta, Metasploit, uh, attack that targets the struts vulnerability and find you know vulnerable hosts over the internet you're going to be much more likely to you know get after those particular vulnerabilities than you are to spend even a short amount of time writing some sort of custom sql injection to get you know data or, or whatever it is that your attack is against a, a single vulnerability in a local um, uh, application but i think the challenge for organizations like you know uh you know large organizations like equifax and some of the other folks that have been breached are that you you can take a cultural solution, you can take an integrated tool solution with applications that are under active development, you know, kind of the, the go forward model, the new development model, um, that that these approaches, you know, can be very good for that sort of thing. But you have to take a very different approach for all the applications that are already deployed, but are no longer necessarily being actively staffed and developed. It's kind of like the difference between regulating, you know, uh, air emissions from businesses that are going concerns versus you know going back and, and dealing with uh, environmental cleanups at, at businesses that are already shut down where nobody is actually still doing business there anymore right so um, there is a, a big challenge in, in going after you know kind of some of those deployed applications that that don't still have active development teams on them uh, you can instrument their pipelines all you want but if there's no code running through the pipeline you're, you're kind of uh, you're kind of done um, and so there's, there's an organizational develop, uh, aspect to this, not just in terms of, you know, kind of working with development, but also in how do you then go after those, uh, those projects that are, are no longer um, in, in operation. But I think the other angle to it is um, the economics on the development team side. So, you know, there are a lot of development teams that see, you know, the inclusion of a component that's been written someplace else as, essentially free velocity. You're getting functionality for free. Uh, you don't have to do anything to move your project forward. I think the challenge that too many organizations are realizing too late is that it's more like that they took out a loan um, and they haven't been making payments on it. And when it comes time to upgrade the component, they find that the effort to, you know, kind of patch to something that's current and supported and not vulnerable anymore uh, is a really, really expensive proposition. And so you have organizations that get stranded on older versions of, of open source development. So, you know, it's not as simple as just using tools. The development teams actually have to, you know, take in mind to, to make periodic payments on their, on their security debt by making sure that the components they're using are secure. Or else, you know, honestly, you get into a point where upgrading the component is, is, more expensive than you know maybe rewriting that part of the application and starting over um, so it, it is a challenging problem um, there's a reason that there are so many attacks now targeting this layer um, it's much harder for a development team to kind of take a new component because they just don't know if it's going to change you know some functionality that they depend on in the application so that's the hard part yep a absolutely um, guys we're, we're running short on time I'd, I'd love to jump more into this but we only have an hour to go over all of these but this this is a world unto you know there's a whole we could do a whole webinar on this alone and maybe that's the answers we'll come back and do that hannah if uh we could stay on the gdpr slide i just want to quickly mention that we are going to be hearing a lot about gdpr at rsa this year 
after years of, of anticipation, it goes into effect the end of May. And this is not just an EU thing. It's going to affect the whole world. Here's the good news, guys. It's not too late. If you haven't done anything with GDPR yet, there's still time. There are no lack of guides and top 10 things to do, and we've covered them here at Security Boulevard at DevOps.com. For the interest of time, Tim and Rami, I'm going to move past the GDPR one. But um, if White ha if White Source and uh, excuse me and Vericode have any GDPR materials, if we can, we'll try to get them out or at least a link to them to everyone who registered for today's webinar. And, and with that said, let's move to our next slide. Oh, and this was the Equifax one that we, we seem to have skipped the GDPR. So now we're at DevSecOps. So guys, as I mentioned, Monday is DevSecOps Day at RSA. We're putting on a full day of, of some great speakers on subject. Tuesday, there's a luncheon we're doing on security and DevSec, uh, DevSecOps, DevOps and security. We're doing a lunch and uh, go to devopsconnect.com if you're interested. But is DevSecOps real? Can security really work with Dev and Ops to make everyone's life easier? And is DevSecOps just AppSec with another name? Rami, I'm going to give you, we only have about nine minutes left, but I'm going to give you a chance to go first on this one. So we... Uh... There are several challenges concerning uh, DevOps and DevSecOps, uh, consequently. The, in general, I would say that the dynamics of, the, of business put a lot of pressure on developer teams, and it's largely driven by uh, the uh, competitive uh, marketplace. It compels uh, startups and developers to boost as much as possible the speed uh, for developing solutions. Now, the, uh, uh, the challenge uh, remains, uh, despite uh, efforts to reduce as much as possible any aspects of concern to security, and that is to introduce appropriate security design and implementation, uh, especially best practices throughout what is an agile life cycle after all. Now, this is not easy, and it is not easily effective. Part of it has to do with the fact that security is not a mere feature, and people need to be reminded about that time and again. It merits special attention. It has arguably become, a, I would say, significantly easier to accommodate a requirement for agility and security with the emergence of advanced tools that, uh, that uh, have uh, uh, become uh, more popular than ever. But it is important that those tools also cater to the preferences of agile teams, and they are, by doing so, able to reduce the headaches, but also improve, ameliorate development pace and facilitate the introduction of higher uh, security uh, processes and design. Now, many people consider uh, security to impede, at least potentially, a DevOps operation, but dealing with security does not. This definitely does not need to hamper the development process and shifting an attention uh, to the uh, product facets, it will likely yield improved uh, agility. What needs to be done in order to uh, uh, overcome this? Uh, there are several things. I'll do. I'll go through a couple of them that pop up uh, in mind. I think that first of all, and I believe I mentioned that briefly earlier, one must attain a security conscious mindset, a, a mindset that is applicable to an agile development life cycle and that really focuses on the people and processes uh, ingredients here. I'm specifically uh, uh, not talking about technology because I consider that to be a given. It is important that the technology matches not just the expectations, but the real way that people and processes work together because this really needs to blend very well. And from the people perspective, it is, imp uh, it, it is important that uh, the, the, the security and app the application security, the cybersecurity, whatever, uh, it must not be regarded as a responsibility of a single role, even a single team. In order to accommodate uh, the security requirements throughout the life cycle, it is imperative to devise an approach where a representative from each department is part of the process here and can collaborate as part of the process. And the organization should be encouraged to review procedures for related tasks such as component selection and also delegation of security authority. This is something that may be unheard of, but security people 
uh, definitely do not tend to relinquish any security authority, such as delegating uh, uh, things that they normally would do. But I really think that in the interest of making the process work among different teams, it is absolutely imperative to at least consider that seriously and make sure that it is not just given some kind of chance to succeed. I believe that this is the only way that processes such, uh, such as these can really succeed. Great. Tim, how about yourself? Sure, I'll keep it brief since I know we're running out of time. Um, I think DevSecOps is real. We certainly see a lot of it uh, when we go out and, and look at companies that are uh, practicing software development, but I also think it's different than the brochure, right? Um, so if you look at the way that we've been told that uh, the DevOps should work, uh, you you know, understand that you're in a future where code is switching continually to production or to a production-like environment um, with all the steps uh, in between automated that you're going to have a team that takes on ops as a responsibility and therefore in the DevSecOps world that they take on you know, the security part as well. Um, and that it's uh, something that's independent of scale, that it's a, it's a methodology that, that should be able to work um, at, you know, for development teams and that it's not just something that, that's practiced by, by unicorns. So I think the last part is true. We do see uh, you know, DevSecOps-like behavior at uh, lots of different organizations. Um, the challenge that we see is that um, smaller organizations can move more quickly to embrace those principles across everything that they're doing. Larger organizations you know, often get stuck. Again, it's the, 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 just like with the AppSec discussion, it's the established applications that are the most challenging to shift. And so in those application uh, teams, you see patterns like continuous uh, integration, but not continuous deployment, or you see a dedicated DevOps uh, staff member um, and not DevOps-like behavior across the whole team. But where you do see the adoption of some of the actual DevOps principles, um, you, we end up seeing uh, you know, the teams taking responsibility for security, and that's good. And they also then press uh, their security vendors to do exactly as Rami said and provide them with tools that better meet, meet the, the job that they're trying to do. And I think that's a really positive outcome. Um, and you can see it in the way that, uh, that the AppSec space uh, in particular has shifted over the last few years. Um, away from organization, you know, uh, or, or an organizational structure in the in the uh, AppSec tool user base uh, that's more like a center of excellence that runs the tool and hands the results to the developer. Developers are taking responsibility for it for themselves. So I think it is real. Absolutely, absolutely. And guys, I mean, all right, I, I have a horse in this race, so I'm not going to tell you. You know differently, but I'd encourage anyone who is not sure about DevSecOps to, um, you know, join in. If you're coming to RSA on Monday, come to our DevSecOps days. If not, check out a ton of the DevSecOps stuff we do, both here on Security Boulevard and at DevOps.com. And you know, stay tuned for an announcement around something called DevSecOps days that'll hopefully be coming to a city near you, no matter where you live in the world. And more about that probably after RSA. It's enough of a tease for that one, though. Um, so, guys, we're right up against it here. I do want to mention two other areas that I think were important. If we can move to the next slide. Please. And then, well, I don't know if it's moving for you, but my slide's not moving. But anyway, our next slide was on, oh, here it is, diversity. And this was something that really reared its head this year in RSA. Originally, the RSA announcement only had one female keynote speaker, though 20% of the speakers at RSA are female. And when we talk about diversity, we're generally not talking, we're talking gender. And um, you know what? I, I'm all for diversity. I'm not all for diversity for diversity's sake. I'm for diversity to make sure that we get the best people up there presenting at showcases like RSA. And, and as we spoke, you know, Tim and Rami and I spoke off camera or off mic, it's really important that for women out there, whether they be little girls like Tim's child 
or women who are maybe graduating college and looking at career choices right now, that they believe and they know that there's a place for them. It, you know, they will go as far as their talent will take them, whether it be in cybersecurity or IT in general or anything else. And I, I, I will give credit where credit's due to the RSA conference. They, the final uh, lineup of keynote speakers does have quite a number of women in it. Um, so with that said, we're at two o'clock. Can't go much further into it. Uh, next slide. Look, if you are going to RSA, it's renowned for some great parties. You know, as important and as great as the sessions are, the socialization aspect should not be missed. If we go to our next slide, Tim, I, I know you were going to talk quickly about Veracode. I'm going to ask for 30 seconds if you can. Sure. Uh, Veracode uh, is now a business unit at CA Technologies. We've been in business since RSA 2007, I think, is when we launched mm -hmm. uh, out of dark mode. And we're a leader in application security. Uh, and we help companies solve the problems of not just the technology around application testing, but also uh, getting through the, the cultural and organizational barriers that keep it from being effective. I was there when they launched in 2007. Next slide. Ravi, give us a little white source 30 seconds, please. Well, white source is a leader in a continuous open source software security and compliance management. A white source offers a, a solution for managing open source security, quality, and licensing a compliance. A, and this secures and manages the components say, for many customers and SMBs worldwide. White Source offers a, a comprehensive suite of the, of the features, including control management, integration, and reporting features. They were designed to automate the management of open source processes, and they span the identification of the components, their detection, alerting, and reporting, along with suggested remediation, as well as risk and compliance analysis and the uh, workflow. We believe that all of this allows organizations to truly reap benefits that are associated with agile development. And the key thing is that it allows to maintain high security and realize also effortless management. Fantastic. Rami, Tim, hey, if we had four hours, we could talk about this for four hours. There's a lot of meat here. There's a lot to see at RSA, too. For those of you going, enjoy it. For those of you not going, we'll cover it here on Security Boulevard. We'll have videos and podcasts and articles and everything else. Vericode, White Source, thank you very much for sponsoring today's webinar. Again, Tim and Rami, great job. And thank you all for listening whether it be live or maybe perhaps starting in a, another hour or two on YouTube. Uh, this is Alan Schimmel for Security Boulevard. You've just listened to another Security Boulevard webinar. Have a great day, everyone. See you at RSA.